Here we go. Once again, thank you everybody for your patience and parking and getting into this space. This is new for me, it's new for everybody. So yeah, welcome. This is uh, the Salt Lake City Python Meetup Group. If you are looking for the PHP Meetup Group, uh, Recursion Pharmaceuticals is that way. So. <laughs> I just. No, I, I completely just. No, none of that is true. Recursion is there, but they don't use PHP. I uh, I'm Ferris, by the way, if we haven't met. I started this meetup group about five years ago with uh, a couple of individuals, one named Dylan, um, other one's Ken, and we, uh, we met in a coffee shop, and we were like, hey, that's a Django admin page in Sugar House Coffee. And I was like, do you know Python? And it turns out there was another Python group, but it was kind of far south and uh, Matt Harrison was part of that, so we started one downtown, and then Matt ran into me in Montreal at PyCon, and he's like, hey man, what the hell? You're like, take my group. I'm like, I I'm sorry. <laughs> Matt gave the blessing to go ahead with Salt Lake City PyCon, and he's been a, a great member, uh, pretty, pretty okay member, actually, let's, let's face it, no. Matt's, Matt's excellent. He's going to be giving a talk today about uh, uh, Freelancing for introverts. Can you tell I just like have not had enough of our cold brew coffee yet? Or maybe too much? 
Um, Matt also authored a number of books, including this one, um, Effective PyCharm. This one is one that he probably doesn't have. It's a signed copy, but it's signed by both authors. So there you go. Unless you have one signed by both? Nope. So, did you bring any others, you said? Yeah, I brought three others. So Sweet. You can decide what you want to do with how many you want to give away. So four books to raffle. <laughs> Since Matt brought three, so I'll leave that up here. So we always have a raffle at the end of these things, and that's a lot of fun. The other thing we'll be raffling off today is, uh, let's see if I have a better example of it, is a Pi badge. Has anybody done hardware programming before? A little bit, a little bit. Well, it turns out you can do it with Python now. You don't have to write any C or any other dumb languages like Java. And so what the Pi badge is, is this little guy. And it's a 1.5 inch by 1.5 inch TFT screen, 250 pixels by 250. It has uh, like eight button inputs, which is pretty nice. And it also has a lithium ion battery. So we're giving away with these two. It has the charging circuit. And the whole thing runs Python. So all you have to do is edit one file, and it's called code.py. And I do note that we have somebody here who is under 18. Any students here who are under 18? Who is that? I saw some kid. Raise your hand. <laughs> Stop looking at your phones. Hey. So we always have a policy. If you're under 18 and you attend one of our meetups, you just automatically win the raffle prize. So one of these is set aside for you and uh, your friend over here. OK? What was your name? Matthew, this is yours, OK? So we were going to just give away two, but because Matthew already stole one, I'm actually going to give away this other thing over here. This is called a Halloween. I didn't want to give it away until the next meetup, but it's pretty much the same thing with fewer buttons, and it's shaped like a skull, which I think is perfect because of our logo. Yeah. Are we liking the mic or no mic? Can you hear me like this? Mic. Mic? No mic. Mic? Okay, mic is good. I'm not used to having a mic for this. But yeah, this thing also has like five little LEDs, and we're going to code a little bit with it with some live coding today. Um, but before we do that, let's keep doing some introductions here. Okay. So some other uh, technology groups around. We got the uh, Python Utah North there up in Logan. That's run by my uh, father, actually. Um, they meet the third Thursday, I believe, of the month. So if you're up and looking, check them out. The Pi Ladies, anybody from the Pi Ladies? Woo -hoo -hoo. When's the next meetup? Last Wednesday of every month. It's the last Wednesday of every month. We're the first, just FYI, if that wasn't clear. Uh, Python at the Point is also Python promo. Matt, do you still attend Python at the Point? Somewhat, not really. I believe they're at Canopy, right? Or do I? Oh, it's, yeah. Okay, so they're still at Canopy. Um, Girl Develop It. Anybody from Girl Develop It? This see. Girl Develop It's a little bit different. They're more uh, project and workshop oriented, and they do any kind of programming uh, language. The Python Data Engineering Meetup. Anybody from that? Anybody? Yeah. Do you, you want to give a spiel? Yeah, the next one's on September 18th. Uh, distributed query caching with something called Alux IO, which I've never heard of before. Alux IO for distributed query caching? Yep, that's, that's a version on the 18th. Okay, find out about the latest data microservice <laughs> at the uh, data engineering meetup. Uh, what else do we got? I am not used to having the screen like, like jogging distance away over here. There's my mouse up here. Yeah, so that's the uh, data engineering. There's also Pi Data and the SLC uh, developer group. So that one's more of a generic language agnostic group. Um, we have a bunch of websites. They're all up here. If you feel like coding, you can go to our GitHubs and like make a pull request because 
I never update our websites because I'm a web engineer. So as soon as you start doing stuff professionally, you can't do it like for fun anymore. I don't know what it is about that, but yeah. So we need some help with the websites if somebody wants to help with that. Um, sponsors today include Pythonistas like you. Thank you for your $5 optional donation. Um, X Mission has been a proud sponsor for the last two years. They've sponsored all of our pizza that you are enjoying today. Uh, University of Utah has been a previous sponsor of our venue, so they deserve a mention. Meetup.com uh, sponsors the actual like subscription fee now. And uh, Tech Systems is the sponsor for these uh, circuit boards that you got. I have to add WeWork now, because WeWork is sponsoring this space for us today. Um, sponsors always appreciated. Please uh, feel free to drop us a line via Meetup. All of our accounting is available and open on meetup.com slash slcpython slash money. We are open accounting process, which means individual names are anonymized, and other than that, you see everything that we purchase and you see all the donations that come in. Uh, that needs to be updated probably up to July, I think we're up to date, so I'll have to sit down and do some accounting. And yeah, oh yeah, we're now tax deductible. So Utah Python is like an umbrella nonprofit that people can affiliate with uh, other meetup groups around the state. If you're an affiliate, then uh, you get a number of things, including uh, additional uh, sponsorships, speakers, resources, things like that. If you're interested in starting a meetup group that is Python oriented or software oriented or education oriented, just let us know and we'll see what it'll take to get us an a affiliation. So, yeah. So this is like, you can tell I copy and paste this all the time, right? So we always do a quick intro if you're new. And we're going to say, uh, Name, occupation, fall goals. Because it's it's pretty much fall. So if you're gonna raise your hand. Because you get to introduce yourself now. Oh now all the hands go down. Okay. <laughs> so I'll start. I'm Fairness. I'm a senior back end uh, janitor at Team slash WeWork. Um, I, my favorite uh, or my fall goal is I know, I'm just pulling it into Favorite summer activity? What did you, what's your favorite thing you Yes, favorite? okay, hiking. I'm going to go with that. Favorite summer activity. Thank you. <laughs> I'm just going to do that. French. Yeah, it speaks French, right? Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> do you ever have one of those days? Well, none of your code works, so like you don't work. Okay. Here you, Sam. Yeah. Hi, so I'm Sam. Um, I am a, I guess you could say I'm currently a software engineer with a company called Limbo. They're based in Lehigh. They're a maintenance management company. I'm actually a Node TypeScript guy, but I worked in Python in the past. Um, I'm kind of, I'm kind of excited to learn other languages like Clojure and Rust and. Um, I do a little bit of game development. I work with other languages like Hacks, uh, GLSL, and, and so forth. Um, I guess my favorite activity this summer would be um, photographing, I guess. My hand is the next person. Hello, I'm Jenna. I'm a remote sensing specialist. I work with Red Castle Resources, which is a contractor for the Forest Service. And I'm new to coding. Uh, my favorite summer activity was kickball. So I'm Josh. Um, <laughs> I'm kind of in between things right now, so looking for work. And my favorite summer activity is hiking. Hi, I'm Camden. I'm currently a student at the University of Utah, and I also like to hike. Hi, I'm David. I'm also I'm also a student at the U, uh, possibly majoring in computer science. I like uh, machine learning, and my favorite summer activity was probably hiking. I wonder the trails were so full this year. (laughs) (laughs) 
Um, my name is um, Alfie Madsen. I'm, um, uh, I'm a mathematician, but, uh, uh, but uh, by occupation, I'm a uh, software developer. And uh, I'm currently in between pos uh, work, uh, positions right now as well. And uh, my favorite uh, consumer activity is exploring things. Who else is new? Thanks, Jen. Hi, I'm Jen. I work at we work with Ferris, actually on Ferris's team. I'm a data engineer. I don't know Python in the slightest. That's why I'm here. Um, <clears throat> my favorite summer activity is probably been backpacking, which is like hiking, slightly different. <laughs> like really heavy backpack hiking. All right, who else is new? I'm new. Hi, I'm new. <laughs> no, my name's Nate. Nate Grigg, G R I G G. That's 60% G. Uh, there's some people floating around whose name is Griggs with an S on the end. That dilutes the G to only 50%. I'm Nate Grigg. Uh, I just got a game in the App Store and the, and the Google Play Store called Maggie, Magnetic Interactive Explorer. I didn't actually use Python to write the game, but I did uh, use Python to. Um, do some of the build some of my level files so that I can uh, parse out the puzzles and blah 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 blah. I like Python; it's fun, so I'm here. Maggie's only 33 percent. Uh, it's less than that, isn't it? It's more like 20 percent. It's only one G. Maggie with one G. Sorry, Maggie M A G I E, Magnetic Interactive Explorer. <laughs> well, what do you do summer activity? Writing Maggie. <laughs> <laughs> I went on a road trip with my wife and kids. We went to uh, the Arch in St. Louis, Missouri, and the Bean in Chicago. So we saw some uh, metal, some large-scale metal sculptures. <laughs> um, Jacob, uh, recent grad in the Y in computer engineering. So most of my Python has been automating uh, testing. So um, yeah, after activity this summer. I just hiked in. I did this over the weekend this last week, so it's still summer. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Emil. I'm a student at the University of Utah. I'm currently studying uh, computer science. I work with um, Java, um, Python, and past kind of rusty on Python. But I'm also into game development and uh, machine learning. Uh, my favorite activity? the summer would be hiking, but recently I went to Lake Powell and that was fun. I knocked a lot of people off the jet ski, so I was okay. <laughs> Say a good time. Anyway. Anybody else is here? All right. So now we're to our next couple sections on the agenda right here. So the next one is uh, the who's hiring and who's looking. So right now we work is hiring pretty much across the entire spectrum, um, even for non-IT positions. You can check that out at we.co slash careers. If you are more data focused, feel free to give Dylan Gregerson an email right there. Um, we're looking for full stack web developers, DevOps, data engineering, data analysis, uh, everything across the board there. So um, the other one we're looking for, SCORE is looking for volunteers. If you have uh, background in entrepreneurship uh, and want to mentor other entrepreneurs and business leaders, SCORE is great. Uh, yeah, does anybody know of other opportunities around the SLC Valley? Uh, America First is hiring a data scientist as well as a data engineer, uh, both heavy Python. The credit union? Yes. Anybody else? Uh, 401 Go is hiring. We do retirement investment software. What are you hiring? Uh, Django developers. Uh, who do we contact? Uh, Nate at 401go.com. Is that right? 
I, sorry, can you give me Jane. 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 Experiences in PHP and uh, JavaScript, uh, so uh, I'm kind of looking for positions like that. But, uh, uh, but I, I really, uh, as a mathematician, I really like to get something. Uh, I'm also interested in um, an, um, analytics and, and uh, machine learning. Where's the link I'm putting it right now. So the link for the agenda is this etherpad, and that is now posted to uh, the meetup group right there. Anybody else who's new? Looking? I'm not new. Or not new looking. Hi, my name is Tom McDaniel. Um, I've been a system administrator for about 20 years, mostly higher ed, and I'm really interested in transitioning into full-time development. Um, I'll put my information back up there, but I'm really proud that I have a, uh, a GitHub project that's almost at 100 stars, so I'm really excited about that. It's a firmware password manager for OS I still believe Anybody else who's looking to get hired? <laughs> right, I guess you, people are not because they're already freelancers, right? That's why they're here. All right. Um, let's see, community news real quick. Oh yeah, look, there's Adam like, editing his stuff. Adam, did you tell me everybody else's? No. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, I get it. Just trying to weed out the competition. No, but seriously, if you did, uh, if you did stand up and speak, please feel free to put your uh, contact details down here, just like Adam's doing. Um, community news. Less than. I get to iterate this. What is it? Four months to our equivalent of Y2K, Python 2.7 will be completely deprecated. So if you're still using Python 2, enjoy the job security, because you're going to be like converting that over. Um, the new blender was released last month, but it bears repeating. I started messing with it, and it is phenomenal. They actually fixed all of the issues with the UI that you've ever had with Blender. If you tried Blender more than six months ago, and you hated it because the UI sucks, because it did, try it again. It's awesome. It's all Python based, which is why we're mentioning it now. It has Python bindings, and you can do some interesting stuff with that. Any other community news that people know about in the ecosystem that is Python? Once, twice, okay. 
um, if you have a new talk or speaker um, that you would like to see here, bring them up to me after this. Um, here's a bunch of talks that people have asked for over the years. I don't think we ever like removed from this list, so it could be you know, overloaded. <laughs> I think a, uh, a talk on Python 3 would be nice. We do have one speaker lined up for uh, October, but if you'd like to speak in October, uh, please grab me at the end of this meetup and I'll get your details and I'll mentor you. If it's your first talk, I'll definitely mentor you through it and uh, you can be presenting too. And yeah, it looks like we're to the first talk, which is going to be my thing. Just this little circuit Python, and we're going to be doing some live coding. Um, but live coding should be done with pair programming, right? So I'm going to actually grab uh, Matt over here, and him and I are going to pair program on this little circuit Python together. Does that sound good? Yeah. Awesome. So yeah, uh, while we get set up here, just take like a three minute break. We're just going to get set up over here. Yeah. Here we go. <sighs> Can you remember those? Do you see that? Do you remember those? I can those. I've done pike. Okay. I had a demo, and I made the stupid, stupid, stupid mistake of saving onto the device, and then it got like it died. Yeah. But I think I got most of it back. So let's... This is a data cable. Yeah, that I, did. I triple checked. Okay. That's always the issue, isn't it? And then I'm just going to, I think what I'll do is I'll just show like how to use libraries, how to use this as like an intro to Python, and we should be good there. That's awesome. So the sponsor bought this? Yeah. Isn't that nice? Yeah. I said I'm going to bring my 10 year old son next time so we can get this. Um, 
And yeah, feel free to take a look at this. I'll have it running, and I'll put it probably on the, the big circular table over here. Um, and yeah, it's just a little Python running device, and you can see it's already outputting code.py output. I'm pair programming, so Matt's, Matt's uh, verifying here. So what do you think we should be doing here, Matt? What's, what's a fun project we could try? Let's get some button inputs, maybe. Yeah. I think we should. I think we should code Pac-Man. <laughs> An entire Pac-Man in 20 minutes. Do the random number. If anybody could do it, it would be Matt Harrison. No. <laughs> no, it says hello world right now, so uh, welcome to the hello world. Yeah, so we did hello world, so you now know Python. That's how it works, right? No, but seriously, uh, let's see. Can everybody see the screen okay? Everybody can see the screen up here okay, or should I make a little bigger? Is that better? Yes. Beautiful. Okay, I'm going to hack over here, which is to say all of these uh, imports over here, I'm going to leave them. And the reason for that is I don't know exactly, or I, this, this is exactly what's on the library. So because this is such a small uh, device, I think it only takes four megabytes like all together. Um, you have to manually drag and drop your library files. And we won't get too much into that. The wiki definitely covers it when you buy one of these. Uh, suffice to say, you need to make a folder called live, and you need to copy your Python modules manually in here. And the last thing to note is their .mpy files. So that's a MicroPython file. Uh, I'm trying to remember, do these open? Yeah, these open uh, as binaries or? Hmm. Let's take a look at it real quick. Yeah, that's definitely binary. So, yeah, these are just uh, byte compiled binary files um, that are ready to go. They have all of the uh, drivers and whatever you need for the hardware on here so that stuff is as easy as saying, you know, NeoPixel dot pixel one or just put it in an array. So I think what we should do is let's just capture some gamepad input. So let's capture like the A button and the B button. So who grew up with a Game Boy? Yeah. So so this is basically a Game Boy, right? We have pretty much all the buttons a Game Boy would have, you know, start, select, B, A. The additional thing that it has is a lithium ion battery, so you never have to run out of those again. And then a uh, uh, five uh, LEDs over here, and they are RGB LEDs, so you can make them whatever color you want. So what we're going to do, I think, is if you hit A, make them all red. If you hit B, make them all blue. Cool. Just make it really simple. Um, yeah, so we got our inputs and our outputs. So the last thing to understand, yeah, last thing to understand is uh, with, when we're writing on a board like this, we're going to be thinking about things in an event-based paradigm, which is to say it's just one giant loop that wraps your entire code, and it's constantly running over and over and over. This loop is some, they're called like ticks, right, Matt? Like, what, what, what's that paradigm called? No? Is it event-based? I don't know. I call it the while true thing. That's technical. I'm just kidding. So while true, we're going to do all our code in here. Now, if you're new to Python or new to programming in general, let's, let's review this stuff real quick. So, while means keep doing this until this is false. But because it's true, it's going to go forever. So, true and false are their reserved names. So, if I make this false and then I add that last E, you'll notice that my editor's like, hey, that's like a Python word. I'm going to make it false right here. And if you want to comment stuff, like write stuff that's not code so that humans can read it later, all you have to do is add a little hash at the beginning, aka the pound symbol. Okay, and then return just says, when I'm done, spit this out. So in this case, I'm just using it so that we have clean syntax, but let's actually put some code in here. So I'm going to cheat a little, if that's okay with everybody, and I'm going to have uh, the example already opened here. And 
this is pretty much where we're going to get to. And this will be pasted on a gist on uh, GitHub. But yeah, again, we have the while true here. And we need to import the pad. So the first library we're going to use is the gamepad shift library. And this one, how we import it is we say, from this module, we're going to import this class. So in Python, classes are capitalized, or title cased, I should say. And we're just going to grab that. Oh, my buttons aren't working. Live coding. It's a lot of fun. And so first we've got to import that library, right? So the first library we're going to need is gamepad shift. So from gamepad shift, import gamepad shift. Next thing we're going to have to do is we're going to have to actually instantiate that variable. So all that means is we're going to take like an object that wraps like the idea of something and put it into a variable. And I'm oversimplifying and Matt is giving me like a cringy face right now, but that's okay. <laughs> All right, so then the next thing we're going to do is we'll start our while true loop. So the actual action is going to go in here. And we're going to make another uh, variable called buttons. And then we're going to do pad dot get pressed so all that'll do is spit out whatever's pressed and the last red and then what we'll do just for funsies So then what we're going to do is in this loop, we're going to actually make sure that somebody's pressing a button. So to do that, we're going to make sure that if the current buttons isn't equal to buttons, we're going to do something. So uh, let, me, let me explain that a little bit better here. So I'm just making sure we have all our imports squared away over here. Digital oh, digital I.O., not display I.O. <coughs> Boom. Okay, so we have digital I.O. imported. Oh, and button right will need to define. So this is a constant. Let's just grab all these. And there we go. So we have kind of the definitions. We have the start. So this is called yak shaving. And the reason it's called yak shaving is because before you get to have fun with a yak, you have to shave the yak. But no, this is, this is also known as boilerplate. This is all the, the work you have to do to do the actual work. And I think if I save this, it should work. Let's see. Yeah, there we go. So if I hit the right button up here, you're going to see that it's saying howdy button right over and over and over and over. Now, why is that? It's because we need to do one more thing. Right, where we set the current buttons to buttons. That way it knows that it was pressed in one tick before. And it should just go once now. Yeah. So now one press equals one press. Nice. And you can't really see that over here. But there is something we can do. 
think we can tail So the people who made this, uh, the Circuit Python project in general, um, they made this, you know, to focus on education, kind of to have a broad audience. They have their own editor that they also released with it. It's called the Mu Editor, and that's what you're looking at right here. Um, it's more focused towards beginners. It's not really made for advanced stuff, but it does have a few really handy features when you're coding on this. The main one being this serial over here, and I'm hoping it loads. Yeah, there we go. So you can see right here, this is the, uh, this is the same output as uh, Matt's hitting that right button. That's what we're seeing over here. Um, a few notes here. So how did I know that it's button left, right, up, down, whatever? Um, what's really nice about these, oh, maybe not on this one. Okay, so a lot of, a lot of the uh, pins and stuff, they are, silk screened right onto the circuit board. And it's kind of hard to see from over here. Sorry, it's kind of a weird demo. So please feel free to come after this demo and have a look and feel with this guy. But you'll see there's like a silk screen like letter right there. Like so D0 right here, that's the output for the uh, RGB LEDs. So if we were to try to look that up and you know we want to know which variable to use, it would be D0, right? It's the same with the other buttons Although on this one, I think they moved them to the back and I covered that with tape, so I can't really see it. So that's on. Um, but yeah, let's, uh, let's get this thing to at least spit out some color, shall we? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so we said you hit one button, we make it red, hit the other button, make it blue. So, oh. Not them. Yeah, I know, right? You know, for being a Python editor, I really wish they let me de-dent. So what's nice is that as you save it, you can debug it. So I'm going to hit left here and right here. And look at that, instant debugging. Man, I wish, our, uh, I wish everything was that easy to debug. Um, so yeah, so we want to make it spit out some colors. To do that, we're going to need one more library, and that library is going to be used uh, to light up the pixels. Um, has anybody ever used an Arduino? Yeah, so if you've ever done RGB on an Arduino without a library, it's a pain in the butt, because you have to make sure that every uh, voltage to each uh, pin into the RGB LED is like perfect, like right on. Right? Am I right? Or it, it's trickier than it should be. We can agree on that. Okay. I'm getting an, an, a, a shrug of agreement across the room. Like, like, if you want it to turn on or not. You know. Yeah. If you want it to work, it's, it's going to be. Work. Work. It, it's weird when you start putting more than like a couple of LEDs on there. Right. Right. But what's nice is that uh, the lovely people at Adafruit already wrote a library that's Python compatible, and it's called NeoPixel. And actually, NeoPixel is a whole brand that they did. So you can actually buy a whole strip of NeoPixels. I think we have them. Uh, maybe I don't have it. But they come in a really long like uh, line, and you can get as many as you want. I think up to like 300. And you can control each and every one individually. So there are projects. Um, there's one, for example, where somebody built a game. And all it is is just one super long line of pixels. And he called it the 1 by 300 game. And it's basically like Space Invaders, but with just one pixel of a different color. It's, it's pretty interesting, actually. Um, I'll have to post a, a link to that on the meetup. But yeah, let's get, let's get some lights going. Um, first step I noticed, personally, um, and I think Lexi, you and I both noticed this the other day when we were messing with this, is uh, it's super bright. So we're going to make sure that we get that brightness super low. Um, yeah. So let's 
use that library over here. And to use a library, of course, we're going to have to import it. And I forgot the import here. Let me find my notes. Yeah, it's just import new. Which variable? Brightness variable. Oh, right. And then we also have to set a brightness variable. And let's set that to like 0 0.04. Like it seriously one is super bright. I'll make it one in a second, and you'll all yell at me for I'll making die. it so bright. Yeah. And then Matt will be, his eyes will be gone. So we're going to do a few things here. So if we hit this button, on the right, we want it to turn blue. Let's turn all of them blue. So to do that, we're going to have to go through each and every pixel and change its brightness. So what we're going to do is we're going to write a loop. So for each pixel in the range from 0 to however many pixels we have, which we need to define, how, are, how, how many are there, Matt? Like there's, looks like there's five. Yeah, so there's five there. So we'll set that as a constant. So for pixel and range, we're going to say neo pixels, and we're going to set the index to that pixel. So that's going to look up that one pixel. So basically, if I was to print right here the uh, pixel right here, that's going to be a number. So, so if I save this, we can mess around with it. I'm going to hit the right button. And you can see right here, here's our loop. So what I really like about this system, like especially if you're teaching, is that, again, you have that instant hey, I have an experiment I want to try, let's try it. Um, the other thing is if you don't have a while true, so if this just runs once, as soon as it's done, you actually get a Python REPL. So that is to say, you have a full Python system. Uh, I can't comment. Just Please. break at the bottom of that. Yeah. Break. Or that. Did that work too? No. Return on work function. Jeez, furious. There we go. So because I broke, we now have the REPL right here. And I think I should be able to just type stuff. Yeah, there we go. So right here, as I'm typing it, it's also typing right on the, uh, the screen right here. I don't know if anybody can see it, but. I can verify that is the case. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, Matt is proving me to not be a liar. Who wants your talk, by the way? However long. So we'll wrap this up fairly quick so that Matt has a chance to rest his hand here. So, so here's our pixel, and we're going to set that to blue. Um, I believe it is uh, pixel order is green, red, blue because we set it up here. Yeah. Uh, so it's going to be zero, zero, and one hundred. I think that should do it. Do you have to say show? Oh yeah, and then neo pixels, which I save dot show. Did it save? We got a break at the bottom. Maybe we remove that. So my computer has a fun thing it likes to do, which is like unmount this thing randomly. I'm not sure if that's what's going on right here. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you're right. I bet you, yep. There it goes. You got to exit the REPL first. So let's see if I hit this. Yay! So there you go. It's blue. So now what we're going to do, let's make it, what do we say, red on the other one? Yeah. 
issues. There. Red, green, or sorry, it was green, red, blue. So it's zero, one hundred, and zero. And I save that, and I'm going to hit. Uh, you want to test it? Sure. Oh, made it green accidentally. That's why we test. <laughs> Let's see. Maybe I had the order wrong. This is why you should read the docs before you demo. <laughs> uh, there we go. It's changing colors. Yay! So yeah, this is fun. There's a lot of stuff you can do with this. You can take any. Uh, you can also take uh, temperature inputs, by the way. Oh, did I mention I had an accelerometer? Um, I should play with that next time. But you can also, uh, yeah, you can also get the accelerometer uh, inputs from somebody moving this. So uh, I think somebody wrote like a Tetris that if you shake it, it will like just send down an extra block just to be a jerk. So that's pretty cool. But yeah, so that's the circuit Python again. We're we gave out one, we're going to give out two more of different types uh, at the end of our talk. So thank you very much for listening to that, and we'll have Matt up in the next uh, three minutes. Thanks. Cool. And if you want to pass this around, we can pass this around. While we're waiting for Matt to set up over here, if you would like some water, we have some over here. If you're interested in getting a tour of this space, by the way, you can sign up right here, um, and if you do sign up, uh, Salt Lake City Python will actually get uh, the referral bonus. So, uh, as an employee, I get the referral bonus, but as Ferris, I'm just going to put it right back into SLC Python. I think if you sign up for a one-person office for a month, we get $500, so that's pretty nice. Um, I think if it's four, four people, I think it ends up being like 2 k something like that, or 5K or something, I don't know. But it's, it's pretty nice referral bonus on our end. Um, so yeah, if you're interested, you can sign up over here. And I'm just gonna leave that there. Is anybody missing a badge? Yeah? All three? Okay, let me get over there. Just, just one, sorry, my badge is What was the number that we got to? I think it. Is it 25? Is anybody 25? 26? Anybody 26? Oh, we have 30? But somebody might have just jumped the gun. Just write 31 on there, if you would, please. Hopefully, there's no collisions. Right, you ready? Yeah, we're good. So Matt Harrison over here, he is he's more OG than me when it comes to Python. Um, he's been in the Utah Python community for what, 15 years? Close to that. Yeah. How many books have you published? Uh, 200 my books, he says? No, no. <laughs> my seventh book should be coming out this month. Seventh book is coming out, and what's that called? It is, through O'Reilly, it's called Machine Learning Pocket Reference. Nice. Yeah. Uh, Matt also wrote the, uh, which was it, the visual guide to Python? Illustrated guide. Illustrated guide for Python. You've given away a few of those. Uh, what are we giving out tonight, Matt? Uh, just the PyCharm book. The PyCharm book, which is a great reference. And I just would like to reiterate, I'm feeling very honored that we have somebody like Matt at our meetup today. So it's pretty awesome. Oh, and the coder's path to wealth and independence. I'm not giving that away. But He's I'm not, not giving that away about that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 
All right, so we've got seven we have to give away in here. Okay, now we're Matt Pearson. Thanks, Paris. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming out. So, yeah, as Paris said, I ran Utah Python for about five years. I've written a couple books. I have authored courses for O'Reilly. I also do live training for O'Reilly as well. So if you're on Safari Online, I do a couple courses there. I Last month, I released a course for Pluralsight on XGBoost. Anyone here use XGBoost? No? OK, a couple people. So I, I don't know, I'm biased, but I think it's the best course there is on XGBoost. Most of the courses out there are pretty sad. So if anyone is interested in that course, I do have some some codes here for Pluralsight. It'll give you like a 30-day pass to Pluralsight. So I've got maybe four of these or five of these. So we can either raffle those off or fight for them or something like that. I did a course with Talk Python. Uh, my company's called Metasnake. I do corporate training and consulting. Most of that's mostly what I do. I've also taught at the U, and I'm doing a course for Stanford this fall on basically exploratory data analysis. So that's a brief introduction about me, just about Metasnake more. Uh, I spend about half my time teaching people how to use Python and do data science. So I really like taking existing technical teams and making sure they know Python. Python, I think you can, if you have background, you can learn Python in like 90 minutes. And so that's what a lot of people do. They just transition their existing skills to Python or go to Stack Overflow and copy and paste code. So I find that you can be productive like that, but a lot of people in industry who are using Python really have a very cursory knowledge of how Python works. And so uh, the goal of Metasnake is to really understand Python, but also I do data science as well. So exploratory data analysis, visualization, uh, pandas, and then machine learning. And then I do consulting as well. So. Okay, and here's some things I like. I, I grew up in Utah, I lived in the Bay Area for nine years and then came back here. So I like being in snow, I like being outside. Things I don't like, I don't like cells or large groups per se. Uh, th th and this talk was ti titled, I mean, I'm just going to clarify a couple things. This talk was titled uh, Consulting for Introverts, Not Freelancing. Um, so just a hack, if you want to like make more money, call yourself a consultant rather than a freelancer. Uh, also, I, I should de describe what my sort of pseudo definition of introvert is. I don't necessarily think that an introvert is someone who's shy per se, could be, but I think an introvert is someone who doesn't get a lot of uh, being with other people isn't what sort of drives them. And a lot of people who are introverted find that being with other people is sort of taxing for them. And so I found out in the past that I'm, and introverts, and some people said introverts are, tend to be very, uh, think about things a little too much, and maybe because they think about things or understand them too much, they tend to be a little humble. I don't know if that's good or not. I'm, always calling yourself as humble is not a good thing. But I found that like when I tried to do cells, and cells, pe you, people would be like, does it do this? I'm like, uh, no. <laughs> and the sales person would say, yeah, it does that, right? So I, I found out that I wasn't good at doing cells. Uh, and I, I'm fine like teaching to a group or doing presentation to a group, but like I don't like to go to parties with tons of people. I'm like, hey, what's up? That's not my, my thing. So. That's my definition of introversion. And, and then we got some youngsters in the room. So caveat, the asterisk by the top. This is sample size one. So this is stuff that I guess has worked for me, but has also worked for people I know. But uh, if, if you're a youngster and you're just starting out in your career, uh, past has shown that like going and working for a company that runs Amazon or Microsoft or Google or Crapple or Facebook is probably going to be a better way to kickstart your career if you want to do that. So um, take that for what it is. Okay. And yeah, like I said, sample size one. Um, I uh, 
So I, I lived in Bay Area for like nine years, and uh, the guy who I did my senior project with, he went to work for Apple after he did our senior project. I think their stock was $5 at that time, and he's still Apple. And uh, yeah, so uh, I, like I said, I might not be the person to talk to, to take advice from, but I'm gonna share my experience. And, and it's called consulting. I might even go so, who, who here wants to consult? Okay, some people. So, okay, some people want to consult. I, I'd say that you could say that this is consultative. I also think it's soft skills. These are skills that if you have these skills, they're going to boost your career and you're going to have, you're going to have opportunities come your way that wouldn't otherwise come your way. Okay, so my, my caveat with Ferris, like Ferris said, this is uh, freelancing. I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it freelancing. When it, it, if I sort of go the freelancing route, I'm putting myself in a race for the bottom with stuff like Odesk, right? And I don't necessarily want to do that. I would rather have uh, people pay me for my expertise, and so just put name hack there by calling it consulting, uh, it sort of change the perception of, of the value you provide. And yeah, I mean, I think I provide good value, but you could say that like I'm just hacking these things. I don't know. Maybe I am, maybe I'm not. So why would someone want to consult? A couple people in here raise their hand why you might want to consult. Uh, if you're working for a company, it's highly likely that this company is, is making many multiples of your salary based on what you do, right? Which could be fine, right? I mean, a lot of people don't have a problem with that. Uh, but what that means is that someone who has skills like you probably can make more money if you know how to get access to that money. Uh, the other thing that I like about consulting is, like I said, I, I like to be outside. If it's a powder day, I want to go skiing, right? And so if I don't have a training and I don't have any prior commitment, then I can do that if, if, I, if I want to, right? Uh, so I, I control my time, but you know, sometimes I'm up at six in the morning, 5.30 in the morning doing a training, online training. Sometimes I'm going to bed at 1 a.m. after doing a training late at night. So I can kind of control what, what I want. I have small kids or smallish kids, I guess. Maybe they're not so small now, but I like to sort of optimize my life around what I want it to be, not around like a nine to five schedule per se. Hey, why might not you want to do consulting? I'd mean, I say first of all, like if you want to be like on your own, the government doesn't necessarily do you many favors for being on your own. It's actually, uh, there's more tax burdens for you being on your own than working for a company. So, sort of pain. Uh, like I said, sales is sort of pain. If, if, if you're on your own full time, like you're basically aware of all these things that happen that if you're in a cubicle, you're sort of oblivious to, right? So, I need to do sales, I need to do marketing. I'm a computer dude, I don't want to like do marketing, that's like a bad word. Uh, run a company, so not only like, do marketing, but I have to like talk to lawyers and talk to insurance people and talk to my accountant and all these things that take time that you just don't have to worry about. And then like I said, also, you know, there is the perception that you're competing with others. This is sort of a race to the bottom, right? And the AI is going to take us all out and there won't be any work to do. So I don't know, maybe we're helping that. So anyway, if that doesn't scare you off, we'll, we'll keep going. If, if you want to actually do consulting, uh, first order, I would say talk to an accountant. I think it's sad that we live in a place where like you have to have a, someone who has like four years of study to like do your taxes, but Accounts that are actually very useful, and I, I love my accountant. He saved me a bunch of money. He's given me good advice, and and so you know, if you want to do this, you know, get your get your company start up right. Uh, talk to an accountant, form an LLC, and, and I would say another hack here is who here has done like work on the side for other people? Okay, so if you've done work on the side for other people, but you haven't like ever like made that known. Um, I'd say make it known, right? Put it on your LinkedIn. I know multiple people who have day jobs, but they also on their LinkedIn have this is blah, 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 consulting or whatnot, right? 
And so that just sort of legitimizes that you take on work, that you are willing to do work, right? And you're not like hiding it, you're not trying to be shady about it. Some of you might have issues with your companies or whatnot where they prevent that sort of thing. Hopefully you don't. But if, if you don't, then I would say a first hack is just to put that on your LinkedIn and put the date when you started doing that consulting, right? And that just puts it out there that, hey, I am a consultant and I have been doing this since this amount of time. Another thing is, just comment on society in general, but for some reason a health insurance broker can get you better insurance going to the same website than you can get by yourself. I don't know why, but if, so if you, if you need to go solo, like I said, the government doesn't necessarily do any favors on this end, but to, if you want to get health insurance, find someone who does that professionally and, and that will, is a good hack. Okay, so this is a, inspired by a data science data scientist who said, he was describing data science, and you know, if you ask 10 people what data science is, you get 10 different answers. You know, some people say it's like a statistician who lives in San Francisco. Some people say it's the person who decides what ad you click on. Some people says it's someone who did stats with a MacBook. Anyway, there are various definitions of data science. This was his. He said it's combining stats and programming and expertise, and that sort of middle there is, is the data scientist. So uh, sort of riffing on that, I'm going to say that there are, I think, three things that are useful in order to hack your social skills. I mean, you could say hacking consulting, but I think it's just general social soft skills in general. And uh, attitude, investing in yourself, and investing in others. So just talk about those. And the first thing about attitude is your mentality. If you think that, you know, I'm competing with everyone, and it's a race to the bottom, you're gonna have a hard time. The truth is, there is a lot of work out there and there's not enough people to provide that work. Like I said, I, I ran Utah Python for five years and uh, Python has boomed since then, but even in the time that I ran it, basically you had a heartbeat and you could program, you could get a job. There are, there are people who want to hire you. So, if you adopt that mentality that there's more than enough work to go around, that might like grease the skid and make it possible for you to like figure out how to capture that work. So, so here's another just attitude uh, shift. Uh, when I was younger, I had a friend who uh, went to school with me, and he was like speaking at all these conferences, doing all these things. And I'm like, this doesn't make sense. Like, he doesn't even have a technical degree. He's a lawyer, and he's like speaking at all these conferences that are like aimed at nerds, right? Didn't make sense to me, but, but the thing that I figured out was that he actually went out of his way to put himself in a position to be speaking about that. And I, I thought, I'm this nerdy person, I work, I have a good job, I know a lot, and so people are going to come to me. And the truth of the matter is like that, that's not how it works. You might think like real life is like this meritocracy, and that might be the case for like the 1% of the 1% who create some super popular open source project. But for most people, that's not how it works. So if you want to be out there, you need to put yourself out there. Okay, at, at this point in time, since I've been sort of doing consulting about six years or so, uh, and note on conferences, I think for me, attending a conference is kind of a waste of time. So, especially as someone who, like I said, if I'm in a big group, but like going around like to the conference floor and like talking to people, that's not my idea of a fun time necessarily, right? So, so it's a waste of time for me to do that. Um, in general, and I don't mean to rag on conferences, I go to conferences. Uh, in general, it's really hard to like from looking at like the conference schedule, determine whether a conference will be good or bad, if the talk is going to like actually align with what, what you want to learn about. Uh, I think there are more effective ways of learning. But I would say that speaking in a conference is completely different, right? So especially if you're someone who, who doesn't want to talk. So there's a, a Valerie Coates from Twitter says, my best pro tip for introverts at conferences is be a speaker. Sounds wild, but you get time to practice and plan ahead, and the people will approach you and you already have something to talk about. 
And I found this to be the case as well, right? So in general, I don't go to a conference unless I'm speaking at it these days, just because it's kind of a waste of time. And since I'm controlling my time, and, and since being on your own, you have a very clear sense of how much your time is actually worth to you. You know, like put a monetary value on your time, right? And, and just going to a conference in general doesn't make sense. It's not a good investment for me. Okay. Uh, another thing is, is just your mentality, right? So if I go to a conference and I'm speaking, the purpose of that is, you know, have people come to me. But, but I also think that, you know, if you have, if you have good thoughts, um, good stuff will come to you. And so I've given this talk a couple times and I, I've had this slide on it. I expect to get business from this talk. So uh, I think that me being here, and I'm not, you might say that this is like Matt's sales pitch, right? Matt's here to talk to you. I guess maybe it is, right? Maybe, I'm not trying to do a hard sales pitch. Hopefully I'm trying to give you super valuable, actionable items that you can take home and apply to your life. But I, I think that I will get business from this talk. And the other times that I have given this talk, I have gotten business from it. Uh, well, I gave it like two weeks ago, and we'll see if something comes out of it. But the other times I've given it, I have gotten business out of it, right? Without me like going out and doing a hard pitch for, for business. So I think that, uh, that, that's just an attitude thing. I, I think that I will get business from this talk. Okay, uh, where do I generally get work? Uh, I'm always hit up on LinkedIn, but 90% of my work comes from referrals or from my network. And, and my network is composed of people in like meetups, right? Like I ran the Utah Python group for, for a long time, so I know a lot of people in the community and also going to conferences, and being able to make a network from going to conferences. Now, like I said, for me, like going and attending conference isn't useful, but like speaking at a conference is useful. For some of you, that might be different, right? You might be able to just go to a conference and network with all these people, and that works for you. So if that works for you, that's awesome. Um, again, this is, this is my experience here. Another thing about attitude is, is goal setting, right? What are your goals? And so I highly encourage you if, you, if you have a goal, or maybe you don't have a goal, you know, like they say goals that aren't written down are like dreams or whatever, fantasies. Um, if, if you want to be a conference speaker, right, if you really want that, then you should make a goal out of it. And, and so what would be a, how would you like realize that goal, right? You've got some people who are like, I'm just graduated or I'm a student, right? How, how, do, I, how do I achieve that goal? That might be like very far-fetched, right? So, so baby steps, right? Ferris just said a couple minutes ago that they've got this huge list of things to talk about, and I'm sure that if you had something that you're doing at school or something that interests you, they'd be more than happy to have you present to the group, right? And so in order to get out there, if, you, if your goal is, I want to speak at a conference, right? I want to speak at PyCon, or whatever. PyCon is actually a very hard conference to speak at because there are so many people who apply to speak at it. But um, maybe a regional Python conference. I mean, you could actually speak at PyCon. That, I just think it's really hard to get into that. Um, or a meetup. Yeah, but, but speaking at a meetup is a good first step, right? And most conferences, if you want to speak there, will ask if you have, have you given this talk before, do you have a video of it or, or a demo, right? So if you've given it at a meetup, that's a good way to sort of grease the skids if, if that's your goal, right? And so my recommendation for you would be, hey, if I want to do this, like I want to give a conference, I want to speak at PyCon 2020, PyCon 2020 website, I went live last week. So you could go there, you could say, I want to speak at that. So in order to speak at that, I need to apply, you know, in like two months. So I need to talk to Ferris like tonight and get something planned you know, in the next two months. I don't know if you have space in the next two months. So PyCon 2020 might be out of the picture, but some other conference, right? But make a goal with concrete steps, but then write them down and move on them, right? There, there are ways to do that. If you don't write it down, it's just gonna be like, oh, I wanna be a conference speaker, but you know, it won't happen. Okay, so that's my spiel on attitude. Uh, let's talk about investing in self. Uh, uh, 
So a long time ago, there was this kid who was approached to write a Python course for Pluralsight when Pluralsight was this company that only did C Sharp .NET content. And this person did said course, or did an audition for said course, and they did it on Linux, which really didn't jive with like C Sharp .NET, because at that time C Sharp and .NET only ran on Windows. So I like, yeah, we like the content, but it's on Linux, and that doesn't really jive with our, our group, and so we're going to reject it. Anyway, long story short, like, this person was me, which uh, I'm not bitter or anything, but the person who ended up writing that course, uh, <coughs> their, their the Python course on Pluralsight is one of the most popular courses on Pluralsight, right? And so it, it has more than... The time they put into making that course more than pay for itself. So, so if said person would have been smart about it, they would have said, okay, it, I have a Linux machine, and I'm fine with Linux, but uh, you want Windows, they would have gone out and bought a Windows machine and redid the course and submitted it on Windows, right? So one of the things you need to, if you're serious about doing things on your own, you need to invest on your own, you need to invest in tools as well, right? So. My advice there would be buy and use the correct tools. If you're looking to put yourself out as an expert on something, you need to use the tools that experts in that area or group are using. Luckily for many of us, Python is a very popular tool that many experts are using, right? And, and so that's a good thing. But there are other things where, yeah, you actually need to go out and buy something or do something to be able to use those correct tools. Um, Another example of investing in self. So, so as I said, I, I've written a couple books. My first book actually came from a conference talk, uh, a, a tutorial that I'd given at PyCon, just about, it was a Foundations of Python tutorial. And I, I, was in, I applied to give it at another conference. And so rather than just rewriting the slides, I, my goal was, instead of rewriting the slides, I'm gonna go out and write a book on this. And so, uh, I did that. I didn't quite achieve my goal. I didn't have the book done by the time the conference came out, but it was close. And I, I would say that right now, having a book is like a business card, especially if you want to put yourself out as a professional or someone who is an expert in some field. You can go and say, hey, I, I can help you, and not only can I help you, like I wrote the book on this, right? And here's the book that I wrote. Writing a book right now is very easy. So there's this thing called self-publishing. Who's aware of like KDP? Has anyone heard of KDP in here? Okay, so one person. So KDP, this is the Kindle something platform. I don't even know what it is. Uh, anyway, it's Amazon's uh, web page that allows you to self-publish. So if, if you want to self-publish a book, all you have to do is provide a PDF of the inside of the book and a PDF of the cover and load it up to a website on Amazon and in 72 hours it will be listed on Amazon website which happens to be like the second biggest search engine in the world that happens to have people's credit cards hooked into it and allows them to buy things with one click. So it's very easy to publish a book. The other thing is, is um, basically every single one of my books uh, publishers have come to me afterwards and said I want to publish, can we buy basically your book and publish it? So it's sort of hacking the publishing game. If your goal is I want to be a published author, right? The traditional route is to go out and write this proposal, send it out to a publisher and uh, they either accept it or reject it and then you go through this thing where you sign a contract and they say we're not gonna pay you very much, we're doing a lot of work and you say okay, I'll sign my soul away and, and then uh, you work on the book and publish it that way. Um, so, so, but they might. You might say, "I want to be published," and you might have this proposal, and they'll say, "No, we don't. We don't trust you, or that doesn't look like a good book, right?" And so, right now, there's nothing stopping you. You can do it, and it turns out that, like, after you have this information about how many books you sell or whatnot, you can go back and you can push. If you want to be published, per se, you can do that, and a publisher. Many publishers, if you have if you have a book that's very successful, will want to publish it as well. So you can sort of hack that publishing game. 
Uh, another, another way to invest in yourself is just to become a leader, right? If you want stuff to come to you, you need to be able to speak authoritatively on things. You need to have uh, people respecting you as a leader. So as an example of that, I, I have this analogy I call the onion skin of open source participation, right? So Python is an open source project. There's many open source libraries. Uh, I've worked with people who have used libraries before, Python libraries before, and they're like, oh, I'm having this problem, right? You're a Python person, come figure it out, right? And yeah, I can do that, right? But I, I would ask them like, well, have you asked about this in the mailing list, or have you filed a bug on this? They're like, no, I haven't done that. Why not? Well, that would take time, and you're right here, blah, 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 right? Excuses, 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 right? Um, so, the, the onion skin, I'm, I'm comparing this to an onion skin. Onions, onions have layers, right? You can peel back, and there's, there's the middle of the onion. And so my, my hypothesis is that the more layers you pull back, the more you participate, the more value it is, right? So you may have heard of something, right? So my colleagues would have heard of a project. Uh, they might have used it, so that's a little bit more, right? I mean, if you're in a job and you're good, yeah, I, I've heard of Django, that's one thing, right? Yeah, I've used Django, I used it for five years. Okay, that's, that's better, right? Um, I file bugs, I use the mailing list, I actually, leverage the community to get work done. It's probably better, right? I'm, I have submitted pull requests to it. That's even better, right? I would want to hire someone who submits pull requests. That's something very nice to have. Or I'm a committer to said project, right? So this is an investment, right? It takes time to do this. But uh, if you want to be authoritative in something, this is one way to do it. Uh, I have a colleague who wanted to be a core Python contributor. And so he, he basically followed those same steps that I outlined before, right? He used Python, he knew about it. He got on the mailing list, started interacting with people. He saw there were bugs that he wanted to fix. And so he started interacting with the developers and started writing patches, right? And eventually he got commit rights, and now he's a core developer. He gets paid very well. Uh, every two year, two times a year, he's flown across the country to meet up with the other core developers, right? So that's an awesome thing that he has on his resume because he invested in himself. Um, so again, that's a goal. If you want to have that goal happen to you, write it down, look at those steps, and figure out those steps to do that. Uh, other things you can do to become a leader, uh, like I said, Talking in a meetup is one thing. Sharing things on social media is sort of silly, but there are like people who are considered leaders because they post things on Twitter, right? And because they are very good with emojis, people respect them, right? And they have <laughs> lots of followers. I, I mean, that's the truth, right? They, they are good with emojis. Okay, uh, blogging, I mean, blogging is sort of gone away somewhat, but I, I mean, we have like Medium, which uh, I hate that I have to go into like inconspicuous mode every time I have to access a Medium article, but blogging is a great way to become an expert as well. Presenting is, is an, another way as well. Uh, there is a fellow, David Robinson, who, after I gave this talk, he gave a similar talk at an R conference uh, called The Effectiveness of Public Work, and he basically gives these steps here. So he says blog, tweet. It's interesting that he puts tweeting. This, these are listed in his words, like order of difficulty, right? So it's really easy to write a blog. It's kind of harder to tweet. <laughs> so maybe like figuring out what emojis you put on things are hard. Uh, contribute to open source. Give talks. Record screencasts and write a book. I don't. I don't know what I would say write a book's the hardest one on there, but um, that, that's what you put. But but his premise there again is. If you do this, you're sort of sharing with others, you're helping the common good, but things will come back to you as well, right? The attitude or mentality that there's more than enough work to come around, things will come back to you. Other things you can do to invest in self, get enough sleep. Uh, I feel like an old man, so sleeping is like, when I was fresh out of college, like sleep, who needs that? Now it's super important, right? Exercising. As someone who 
I like to be outside, so I, I, I like exercising. But also, you know, I, I need to take care of myself because I'm it, right? Um, I don't have someone else doing something else for me. It's like, yeah, you need to take care of yourself. Also, mental health. Mental health is something you need to be aware of. Uh, maybe not taking on more than you can handle. Uh, being aware of burnout, those sorts of issues as well. And these are things that you need to do to uh, keep keep your business or keep yourself going. Okay, another, another tweet from uh, Kelly. So, yeah, like I said, tweet, Twitter, you can tweet. There's no emojis in this, but like, the secret to becoming a better developer, you heard it here first. Get more sleep. Has anyone in here ever had a problem, like a bug they're encountering, and they're like hacking away on it? <laughs> Oh, that didn't work. Switch that up. Switch those two lines, right? It's just not working. They go to sleep, and you like, in the middle of the night, you wake up and you're like, that was it, right? Has that happened to anyone? Okay. A lot of you that has happened to. Yeah. And I actually reading about, um, so since I, since I teach people, I'm interested in learning. I've been reading about and studying about how people learn, right? And it turns out that like your brain does things like while you're sleeping, it like basically defragments your mind. And if you remember like the DOS days of like hard drive defragmentation, but basically your brain does something similar. And so when you're sleeping, it sort of cleans out your mind, gets rid of like stuff that you don't need to worry about, and like stuff that you've been like focusing on, it sort of like shifts it around and puts it in ways that like you understand it better. And so literally, like I said, get more sleep, but like this is something that like, I actually used to take naps at work. I'd like lay down and take a nap at work. Anyway, don't tell my old boss that. Um, I think it was useful. What's, um, fire? what's that? What's it getting to do fire? Yeah, I don't know. I'd have to wake me up. That'd be embarrassing. Uh, best debugger ever made is a good night's sleep. Oh, there's two tweets that say the same thing. It must be true. It's on the internet. Okay. Uh, the last topic I want to talk about is investing in others. Again, this abundance mentality that there is more than enough work to go around, and I've seen this play out again and again as someone who is, has been very involved in my like community, sort of connecting recruiters with people who need jobs, but also being out there and, and trying to get work for myself. Uh, so it, it's a pretty small world. I know most of the people who are Python trainers who are doing basically the same thing that I'm doing, like selling snake oil, literally. Uh, these people are not my competition. In fact, just today, I had uh, another Python trainer who basically does what I do, send me job, send me work. Um, so. Again, this is a mentality shift, right? These are people that are in my network, even though we're doing the same thing. Um, if, if you are good to others, if you invest in others, you know, if you've got too much work, you push it off to someone else, uh, I think good things will come to that. Um, funny story, I was recently asked to, someone who resells my training asked me to like do a bid for, for someone, I was like, sure, I'll do the bid. And, and then um, one of my clients asked me to do a bid for some work. And I'm like, okay, yeah, here's the bid for this work. Uh, and and then the person who's reselling my training came back, and they're like, oh, and this is the dates. Have to be the same dates as my client asked me to do. And so I was actually competing with myself to these people who are reselling my stuff. So, anyways, weird weird stuff. Like I am my own competition, but these people around me are not my competition per se. In fact, I've done work for them. Like I said, they give me work as well. So another thing is just um, rather than going out and straight on pitching people, have the attitude that like there's more than enough work to go around, but also how can I help you? And, and so I'll put this out here tonight to the group here. If there's anyone out here in the audience that I, through my network or through stuff I've done that I can help, let me know, come talk to me afterwards, and uh, I'm more than happy to, to see what I can do to help you, right? Without, I'm not gonna try and sell you anything. If I can help you, let me know. Another useful thing is having a mastermind group, people who are doing things similar to you. 
Uh, these people can keep you in line. Uh, they can inspire you. You can learn from them. You can see what works, what doesn't work. So like I said, I know many people in the Python world who are doing very similar things. Uh, we have phone calls. We collaborate. We sort of tell each other how we're doing, what, what, what works, what doesn't work. So uh, you, know, you can sort of flip the competition thing into collaboration. Another thing you can do to invest in others is to give clients a fair price. So view your clients as others, right? But that also means like sometimes you might have to drop a client, right? Sometimes you have a client that isn't working out for you, either maybe through something that you've done or something that they've done or some miscommunication. So I don't think it's right to like mislead a client and if the client isn't working out for you or they, uh, it's easier to say, hey, I've got someone else, maybe they can help you, or uh, maybe we can hand this off in a, another way. But sort of tricking or misleading clients, I don't think it is a good thing to do as well. Another thing uh, to invest in others, like I said, uh, the more good you do, the more good will come back to you. Be charitable, donate, teach. So this, this fall, I will be teaching a course called Data Science for Elementary Students. I'm teaching that, I think, I don't know, that might be the first like data science course ever for like third graders, but um, we'll see how it goes. I, I'm interested. I'm interested in seeing how it goes. I know that the, I've already got the, they already have access to Jupiter, so that's cool. So I think we should be good, but um, yeah. So put yourself out there, right? Uh, most of us in here are extremely blessed. We, we have great skills, we're in a great place, and I think you should spread the love if you can. Okay, like I said, there, there's my offer. You know, if I can do something, let me know. I'm more than happy to help. Okay, uh, a book that I have found very useful is this book right here. The, the Coder's Path to Wealth and Independence. It's like, I don't know, very, uh, weird title, New Age title or something. But it, it, I recommend that book. Uh, a lot of people have come up to me and bought it uh, based on conversations and have enjoyed it as well. Just talks about basically a fellow coder dude who uh, just basically lays out everything that he does, right? And he, he's very successful. Yeah, so in summary, I've talked a lot about consulting, but again, I think this applies to just soft skills in general, right? Uh, the better attitude you have, the more you're able to invest in yourself, the more you're able to invest in others, good things will come back to you as well. Okay, uh, thank you everyone. Pleasure to talk to you. If you want to follow me on Twitter, my username is Dunder and Harrison, that's two underscores. And if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, just say that you were in uh, the class here and I'll uh, connect with you. Any questions? Um, so, like, offering free help to people, how, how much? I mean, I guess if I don't have any pain work, that doesn't make a difference, right? How much I give away. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting, like, people will do a lot of stuff for free, right? That they want to do what someone paid them to do, right? But then they're sort of, yeah, okay, but if you do this much, I'll, I'll, I'll pay for that. So, uh, I think my point there is, like, like I, I could probably spend all day, like, answering random emails or whatever on, that come into me, or, like, hey, I, I want you to do this or this or this, or, like, basically me Googling things for people because they think it's easier for them to email me than to just like type that into a search engine. Um, I, don't, I don't know that that's actually useful, right? right. But, but the point is, is to uh, put yourself out of there, sacrifice for others, but more, I, I would say, I'm not gonna do this for random Joe Schmo who talks to me on the internet, right? Yeah. But if it's, if it's someone who I can have a face-to-face -face interaction with, um, I think it makes sense to, to help out people if you can, right? Uh, so, 
I guess you'd have to kind of balance, right? Sure. I don't know if that answers your question or not. Yeah. Greg with three G's, 50% G's? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm 0% G's. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll get you there. <laughs> yeah. What are you going to teach those third graders? What am I going to teach the third graders? I'm actually going to ask Twitter what I should teach the third graders. <laughs> um, no, I am. Uh, but, um, so, I have a son who's like, he, he just devours books, and, and he all he really likes these like factoid books. So one day he came home and he uh, he had, he had made a pie chart of the presidents and their political parties. Right. First of all, pie chart is like a big no-no, um, but. Um, <laughs> To actually like gone out and tallied all their political parties and then put it on the pie chart sort of blew me away. But um, so I'll probably riff on that a little bit. But I'm trying to figure out like you know if we can do some clustering or uh, do something with Pokemon characters. I don't know. I, I've got some ideas, right? I mean, I have a lot of data material that I teach to like big. Grown-ups, just gotta figure out how to like make it interesting. So if you have ideas, let me know. Okay, anyone else? So I take your point that like you know you get a lot of your your, um, your clientele, your business, and everything from from this investing in others and investing in yourself and going and doing that work and stuff like that. How much of your time? With that, do you think you end up spending having to work on like sales pitches and stuff versus the actual like more technical work? Yeah. I, so I'm not sure if your question if the question is so the question is I think you invest a lot in others, how much of your time are you actually doing sales versus actually doing work? Right? I mean more like uh, um, you know, you, I, I, what I was trying to say is like you I see that you can get a lot of your business and things like that from you know networking and, and doing these sorts of things, investing in others, right? Mm -hmm. um, I presume that on top of that, you still have to do a little bit of hard pitch. Yeah. Right? How much of it? Yeah, I mean, my my hard pitch is basically like I'll get an email and I'm like, let's have a phone call, right? What are your training needs? Because that mostly it's like they're coming to me. It's inbound. Like I'm interested in training on this. Okay, let, let's talk about what you need, right? Uh, I mean, I'll like I'll go to a conference and there's a bunch of vendors. I'll like, go around and like say, hey, well, who's your who's in charge of like training here, right? Is anyone in charge of training, right? Let's connect on LinkedIn, that sort of thing, right? But I that's not as fruitful for me as, as sort of providing value and making it known what I do. And for me, I found that it comes in the other way. I mean, there's. And that, that's sort of the training side, right? But like, I'm, there's tons of like people who want people to do just Python work, right? And so I, I've sort of like limited that sort of like Python, just do Python work stuff, just because it's not super interesting to me. But I mean, I could be doing that full time if I wanted to as well. I don't know if that answers the question at all. Yeah, I, I, like I said, I'm I'm not I, I'm not doing very many hard sales pitches. I probably should do more, but I mean the other thing is like it's kind of hard to crack. Like my ideal client is an enterprise company that has large training budget and has wants to train people, right? It's not necessarily a small startup who wants to do one-off training, and so that's a long sales cycle, and, and most of that again is, is through my network. Or through someone who's been in the training is like, hey, we need to get this guy in bring him in. That it?